Cool. Yeah, we can start. Um, so we were discussing dynamic programming in the previous class. And the idea of dynamic programming was that we compute value functions iteratively, uh, starting from the final time step all the way to the first time step. And in the process, we also happened to compute the optimal strategy. And it was based on the principle of optimality, which said that gamma star is optimal if and only if gamma t star, gamma t star, capital T minus one star, is optimal for all t. And this is optimal for the truncated problem. Is optimal for truncated problem. Okay, and we were looking at this particular problem which is a resource allocation or consumption problem. So xt plus one is xt minus ut, and I want to minimize the sum total of minus log of ut, t equals zero to capital T minus one. And I want to find an optimal policy, gamma. Uh, I don't quite remember what all things we had proved. So we had proved that gamma star, oh, let's, let's do the derivation once more. So my V of capital T is equal to zero because there is no terminal cost. Uh, then I wanted to compute gamma star T minus one of x t minus one, and we realize that this is equal to x t minus one. So that was one result, and then my v of t minus one was equal to minus log x t minus one. I think these were the three things we had proved in the previous class. So no matter what happens, I should exhaust all the resources that is left over at the end of the, in the final decision step in order to maximize my, or minimize my total cost or maximize my total utility. Okay. Now the goal is to compute V gamma star T minus two, X T minus two, and this would be argmin u t minus two of minus log of u t minus two minus log of x t minus two minus u t minus two. Well, let me write it as v t minus one, so that's argument okay now everything looks correct Is everything legible? I think so, okay. Now the, the point we were trying to do, the, 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 we were trying to find the argument of this particular problem, and let's try to use uh, the regular derivative to compute the argument. Um, so I have minus one over u 
t minus 2 minus 1 over x t minus 2 minus u t minus 2 this is equal to 0. So that is the first derivative uh, and I know that this is a convex function. I know that this is a convex function so I can just take the first derivative equal to 0 and what I get is oh there has to be a plus sign here because I am taking the derivative with respect to u. Okay, so this implies u t minus 2 should be x t minus 2 over 2. So the argument is x t minus 2 over 2. Any questions so far? <coughs> Straightforward. So of course, ut minus 2 is not unbounded. This must lie between 0 and xt minus 2. But once we do the first order derivative and we figure out what ut star minus 2 is, it seems like it is already within this particular set. So therefore, there is no problem. It is the optimal solution. If it were at the boundary, then we might have to use Lagrange multiplier theorem to figure out what the optimal solution is. But in this particular situation, we don't necessarily have to go there because the solution will always be in the interior of the constraint set. Okay. So do we see a, uh, what is V star of t minus 2? No, V t minus 2 of x t minus 2. That's minus log x t minus 2 over 2 minus log x t minus 2 over 2 equals to minus 2 log x t minus 2 over 2. Do we see a pattern here? What is the pattern here? Right, so V of t, V of small t, x of small t, let me write it on the other side. So V of t, x t seems like this is minus t minus t log of x t over t minus t and then gamma star of t of x t is x t over t minus t. Okay, this is this is what we see as a pattern emerging in this particular example. Do all of you agree that we are seeing this pattern in the value functions? Let's try and prove if this is indeed correct. So this is something that we, so this is something you actually do. If you, have so, if you solve a problem which has a lot of structure, um, you look at the solution at time t minus 1, look at the solution at time t minus 2, do some pattern classification, machine learning, artificial intelligence, well, not artificial, natural intelligence that we all have. So use that to come up with some sort of pattern in the value function and the strategy and then use induction to prove it, okay? So induction step, step one, it's true, it's step two, it's true. Let's assume that at step t plus one, this is indeed the functional form. Let's prove that at step t, we have the same functional form. Maybe we don't, I don't want to do it here, let me do it here.
okay so gamma star of t of x t is argument minus log of u t minus log of x t minus no minus t minus t plus 1 t minus t plus 1 looks like I do need to erase this part so t minus t plus 1 log of x t plus 1 over t minus t plus 1. Right, this is what we want to solve. I am going to substitute x t plus 1 with x t minus u t and then see what we get. log of x t minus u t and then plus t minus t plus 1 log of t minus t plus 1. Okay. Yes. So x t plus 1 is equal to x t minus u t. So there is a dependence. So whatever you do, whatever action you take at time t affects the future state. So you want to capture that here in the value function. Any other question? So now, uh, I have the first two terms that depends on ut, I have the third term which is actually a constant so I can not worry about it while doing the optimization. So again, uh, I need to pick a ut between 0 and xt, uh, let's just take the first derivative and see what we get. So I get minus 1 over ut and then plus t minus t plus 1 over x t minus u t equals to 0. This implies x t minus u t is equal to t minus t plus 1 u t which means u t equals to x t over t minus t. Okay, so the argument turns out to be x t over t minus t. That's cool, so this pattern seems to be matching. We also need to check for the pattern for the value function. So gamma star t seems to be matching, so that's a good news. We are on the right path. Let's compute v of t of x of t. It's minus log x t over t minus t minus x 
x t minus x t minus u t what is this equal to x t 1 minus 1 over okay and then there is a plus okay just doing the regular addition multiplication using log all high school stuff to get minus t minus t log of x t over t minus t. Okay, all of you agree with this? Any errors anywhere? I, I don't think so. And so this also matches with the pattern we had identified. So therefore, induction step is complete. And this is indeed what the value function and the policy function looks like at all time steps. So this is the optimal strategy. Well, this is the optimal strategy and this is the corresponding value function at time t. So this is how we apply dynamic programming. Of course, this is an easy problem, so everything can be done by hand. But in more complicated problem, you will have to implement an algorithm that does this for every possible state xt and uh, computes, stores this value function and as well as the policy function for every possible realization of the state. Naturally, the memory requirement would be significant, okay? Um, sometimes, um, as in this case, as well as in the case of policy function, I, I'm sure you can observe that there is a functional form of the policy function as well as the value function. And so that you can use this idea to actually compress while you are storing the value function and policy function in a computer. Um, so basically the policy function comes from a parameterized class which is a linear function of xt and the value function comes from a parameterized class which is some multiplicative factor log of xt over another factor, okay? So if you want to store it in a computer efficiently in in order to store the policy function, all you need to store is the denominator. And in order to store the value function, all you need to store is, well, this num these two numbers are equal, so you just have to store this particular number and the fact that there is a function log that you have to use while you are computing the value function. So it's important, this idea, this particular idea is very important because uh, when we talk about approximate dynamic programming in the future and uh, some of you might be working on um, deep reinforcement learning or some sort of function approximation class. Uh, whenever your functional form is unknown, you try to replace the function with some parameterized class of function, and then in that case, you only have to store the parameters and not the whole function itself. And the same thing happens for policy as well. Okay, so in typically the new field of deep reinforcement learning, which is uh, actually not very new, it's been around for 20, 25 years, except that there was no deep in the uh, neural network case. Um, the value functions are approximated using a neural network and the policy functions are also approximated using a neural network, right? So that's a way to reduce the complexity of the storage 
because now you don't have to uh, you don't have to if you want to store a function typically if you want to store a function you will evaluate the function at very specific points with sufficient uh, re uh, resolution and then you will store all these values in your computer and so it becomes terabytes of data if your state space is sufficiently large. Um, but if you are using neural networks to compress the class of functions, then you can, you don't have to store so many data points. You can just store the weights of the neural network and that's more than enough. So we'll get to it when the time comes, but at this point of time, I want you to observe that the policy has a specific functional form the value function has a specific functional form, and so storage of this functional form is much easier on a computer in comparison to storing the entire policy using this, using this method, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so we start in this particular dynamic programming problem. We start with x naught, so I want to compute u0 star, u1 star, u2 star, because there is no uncertainty, nothing can go wrong in this deterministic problem. So I want to find out how much is the consumption at every point of time, okay? So what is u1 star or u0 star? u0 star is x0 over t minus 0, so x0 over t. So this is what this is how much I should consume at the first time instant. So if you have uh, one million dollars and you expect to live only ten years, you should spend hundred thousand dollars in the first year of your retirement. Okay. Let's look at U1 star. U1 star is actually x1 over t minus one, but what is x1? It's x0 minus u0 star, so that's x0, 1 minus 1 over t over t minus 1. Turns out to be equal to x0 over t. Okay? Similarly, you compute any ut star, you will realize that ut star is x0 over t. Okay? Now, instead of, so, so the other thing, the other thing that I want to write is what's the optimal trajectory? So the optimal trajectory x1 star is equal to t minus 1 x0 over t, x2 star is t minus 2 x0 over 3, and so on. xt star equals to t minus t x0 over t. That's the optimal trajectory. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Let's try to suppress the dynamic nature of the problem and solve it as a static problem. So as a static problem, the I want to minimize summation of log of minus log of ut such that summation of x1 equals to x0 minus u0, x2 equals to x minus x1 minus u1 and so on, xt, min, XT equals to xt minus 1, 
minus u t minus 1. So that is my static problem where I, ha I want to minimize the cost subject to t inequality constraints. What is this minimization over? Can someone tell me what this minimization is over? Sorry? Yeah, over x and u. It's a minimization over both x and u because x appears in the constraint even though it doesn't appear in the objective function. Okay. Um, there are t equality constraints and I have t unknowns here, so let me just, well, I have two t unknowns, but let me just uh, replace all of this with, uh, I want to eliminate all these variables, so let me try to do that. This problem is equivalent to minimize over all u minus summation log of u t such that u0 plus ut minus 1 is less than or equal to x0 because we want xt minus xt to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? All of you know how we got this. So x1 is equal to x0 minus u0, so I substitute x1 from here, so I have x2 equals to x0 minus u0 minus u1, and so on, and I have xt equals to x0 minus u1 minus u2 all the way up to minus ut minus 1, and I need xt to be greater than or equal to 0, so that implies this particular expression. Okay. Now, I want to ask you one question. Do, so, we have an inequality constraint here. Do you think that the inequality constraint would be valid or do you think that it's not going to be constrained at the optimal solution? Knowing well that minus log of u is a decreasing, monotonically decreasing function of u. Again, my question is, at the optimal solution, is the constraint going to be valid or is the constraint going to be strict inequality? Yeah, valid. So constraint is going to be active. Why? Come up, come up with a more mathematical argument. The, the objective function is, uh, is complex. Yes. And you are capturing this column because it's linear. Yes. So, it ends up at this point. No. So, objective function is convex, yes. And the constraint is, of course, we have other constraints, ut to be greater than or equal to 0. So, but I'm just worried about this constraint, not about this constraint. So, the objective function is convex, which is correct. Uh, but that doesn't imply, and, and my constraint set is convex, but that doesn't imply that my solution will be at the boundary. It could be at the interior. Um, because if the, if, if the inequality was not strict, then you could like increase the values and decrease the overall value of the function. Yes. Yes. Anyone else who wants to? Anyone else who wants to give it a shot? That, that is indeed correct. Uh, so if, the, if there was strict inequality at the optimal solution, then it means that there is some amount of resource left at the end, at the final time step. But I could consume it at one of the earlier times to increase my overall, or, or to minimize my overall cost, or to increase my overall reward. Um, Let's come up with the example. So you have $1 million and you have 10 years to live. Uh, let's assume that you only spend $90,000 every year instead of $100,000. Uh, 
then you will have $100,000 left at the end of the 10th year and you realize that you could have used $10,000 extra throughout your lifetime uh, to get more benefit and be left with nothing at the end of your lifetime. So, so that's the reason why at Optimal Solution, U0 star plus UT minus one star, will be equal to x naught. Okay, this is a claim. I'm thinking whether I should give it to you in midterm or whether I should solve it on the board. Uh, let's let's just do it on the board. So proof. Suppose u star is optimal, but summation of u t star is less than x naught. Pick epsilon equal to x naught minus summation of u t star, which is greater than 0. and define u bar u u bar vector such that u bar 0 equals to u 0 star u t minus 2 bar u t minus 2 star u t minus 1 bar u t minus 1 star plus epsilon Okay, so I have this. What's uh, summation of so j u bar vector is equal to summation of minus log u let me do some j u bar vector minus j of u bar star equals to minus log of u t minus 1 star plus epsilon minus log of or plus log of u t minus 1 star. and this is strictly negative. So what does it violate? Violates the optimality of u star, which implies that u bar star is not optimal. So our hypothesis that u star is optimal was false. Okay, so now that we know, well, let me wait for people to finish writing it up. Okay, so now that we know that 
the, at the optimal point, we will have the sum of ut star equals to x0, which means everything will get exhausted by the end of the time period. What would the optimal solution be for this problem? For this static problem? So all these variables are have the same coefficient. The cost function is also symmetric in the variables. So actually, ut star would be x0 over t. OK. Does that make sense? So if I solve for the open loop optimal policy, it turns out to be x0 over t. If I solve for closed loop optimal policy using dynamic programming, I realize that on, along the optimal trajectory, so if nothing has changed, you will have the same optimal solution. OK? Let me make that point once more. If you use dynamic programming along the optimal trajectory, you will have the same optimal solution as you would have had if you had solved the original problem by using the maximum principal approach or by suppressing the dynamic nature of the problem and treating it as a static problem and compute the open loop optimal policy. And that's very important because if uh, we know that this particular method uh, using, uh, so if you don't use dynamic programming, your solution is going to be open loop. Uh, and we have argued that open loop policy is not very good. But if your system is deterministic, nothing is going to change, or things are not going to change significantly, then you will almost always be on the optimal trajectory. And therefore, the optimal open loop policy that you have obtained is almost optimal for the, for the system that, is, that you are controlling. And that explains why um, in automotive systems, if you want to do optimization, not just in automotive system, even in aerospace system, so how rockets are launched and goes into the space, uh, they typically make use of the open loop policy uh, primarily because things don't change much in space, right? If a satellite is revolving around Earth, it will revolve around Earth for millions of years. Um, so in those situations, open loop policy is very much justified because um, you, are, you are in deterministic domain. There is no stochasticity. In economics, economic problems, you have disasters, you have um, unrest, you could have some political situations going on, because of which the economy goes up and down. And therefore, open loop policy doesn't really help you much. You want to always be uh, controlling using closed loop policy. So I don't know if you've heard, but uh, the US federal government has reduced the mortgage interest rate recently to pump up the economy. So that's one of the control variable UT the government has to maximize some welfare function for the economy. And so they reduce the interest rate whenever they want the economy to go up, and they increase the interest rate whenever they want to reduce the growth in economy. Uh, and the growth in economy is directly linked to the inflation. So there have been situations where, so for instance, in Zimbabwe, a few years ago, there was such a situation where uh, you went to go to buy, I mean, you go to buy bread, and you ask him, okay, how much is the bread for? And they said $100. And you bought the bread, and you took out your wallet to pay them the money, and by that time, the price had increased to $110. Okay, so the inflation was rising so much of the order of 1 million percent or something every year that uh, that, things went completely out of hand. So that's an unstable system where things blew to infinity. Um, so of course, different governments have different policies uh, to improve the economy and, and maximize the overall welfare. Um, and in the case of federal government, 
Um, they, of course, make laws, but the most important control lever they have is the flow of money and the interest rates. Those are the two important things that the federal government commands in most of the economies around the world. Okay. The other thing I want to uh, emphasize here is, of course, if your environment changes, your open loop policy is no longer a good policy because things have changed considerably. So for instance, uh, you were spending according to this pattern and suddenly in the fifth year, you realize that you won a lottery and you have an, another $1 million to spend. Or you lost a lot of money in some business venture and so you cannot have the entire $500,000 at your disposal. Uh, this policy is much better in those situations. So whenever you have uncertainty, you want to compute the closed loop policy because it allows you, if you went off the equilibrium path because of whatever reason, if you went off the equilibrium path, it allows you to update your optimal actions based on the current state. Okay? Is that point clear? Yeah. Uh, so the objective function that we have here, it is not changing. It's not changing. But the dynamics is not changing. It's just that some things might happen which you hadn't accounted for at the beginning. So how would that come up in, in a situation here? Yeah, so in that situation, sometimes or most of the times, you model it as some sort of noise, W0. And if you have noise acting at all the time steps, and you've assumed noise is equal to 0 in order to compute the open loop policy, and it turns out that noise is non-zero and sometimes it could be a big shock, then closed loop policy is always better. So do you need a deterministic model of the noise for that? No, noise inherently means that it has to be stochastic, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have a deterministic. If it is deterministic, then it's part of the state transition function. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And what if you wanted to change the objective function? Ah, that's a good point. So if you want to change the objective function, you have to redo the entire computation all over again. Okay, yeah, all over again. You have to just restart from the beginning. Um, in fact, even dynamic programming is not useful in that situation. And it's not an unheard scenario. So for instance, if you're controlling your car, something breaks down, the entire dynamics of the system change, and now you are at a new operating, new, your FT changes, your state transition function changes. And perhaps you have more noise, more vibration, which you want to control, so your objective function would also change appropriately. So it, it's, it's very much a possible situation. Any other question? OK. So now I want to, so with this background, I want to come to the following topic, which is time consistency. So time consistency of optimal policies. And this is something that we hadn't touched upon so far because we are looking at static problems. But now when you are in dynamic domain, time consistency is important. So you could have two policies. Uh, Let's say, let me use gamma to denote open loop policy as well as closed loop policy. Okay, so gamma is just some policy that maps xt to ut. So there are three types of policies. The first type of policy is weakly. Weekly time consistent policy. So gamma is, or gamma star is weekly time consistent. It's a definition if and only if.
gamma t star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal if the controller applied gamma 1 star to gamma t minus 1 star in the past. OK, so if you have acted according to the optimal policies in the past, then your future policies are also optimal. Strongly time consistent so gamma star is strongly time consistent if and only if gamma t star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal no matter what policy you used in the in the past i'm writing you but i really mean controller And the third one is not time consistent. So the optimal policies continue to change no matter what you did. OK, let me, people are still writing, so let's wait for a bit. What do you think maximum principle would yield? What kind of optimal policy is maximum principle giving you? Yeah. Why? Right. So you have to apply the optimal trajectory, optimal actions that you have computed in the past in order for the rest of the actions to be optimal. If you did not apply the optimal action you had computed, you have to redo the computation. Okay, so the rest of the trajectory is no longer, rest of the optimal solution is no longer optimal. So the solution you obtain from maximum principle, application of maximum principle, is actually a weekly time consistent optimal policy. What about dynamic programming? What about dynamic programming? Yeah. Why? That's right. Right. So this is optimal for the rest of the time horizon. And it doesn't matter what you have done in the past. OK? It's completely immaterial. So dynamic programming yields a strongly time consistent policy, OK, in a finite horizon setting. What about non-time consistent? OK, so let me give you an example. Um, suppose I give you an offer that I can give you $10 today or $11 one year later. What would you do? Which option would you pick? What's your action? What's the optimal choice for you? OK, let me write it down. So $10 today, $11 a year later. What would, the, what would your choice be? What's your optimal choice? 
based on your personality type, based on your preferences, or whatever. Okay, let me, so this is choice A and choice B. How many of you will pick choice A? Okay, a lot of people. How many of you will pick choice B? <laughs> there is only one rational person in this class. Okay, so if you want to maximize your total cost or total reward, certainly this is the optimal choice to pick, right? Because $11 is strictly better than $10. But for some reason, uh, you guys have picked uh, choice A, even though it's not the optimal choice. Okay? Okay, all right, so all of us agree that this choice is preferred, right? Let's change the decision problem now. Problem A, $10 a year later, or choice B is $11 1.5 years later. Or whatever, one year, one year, some one year plus epsilon later. Okay? Which of the choices are you going to pick? So this is the choice you picked in the original decision problem. What about this problem? How many of you will pick choice A? Okay, three people. <laughs> How many of you will pick choice B? Okay, majority of the class. Okay, so if, a, if an optimization problem is given to you today, you're going to pick something. If the same optimization problem is given to you a year later, you're going to pick some other choice, right? So you switch your optimal action, and this is a not time consistent solution, okay? Because if you're solving a long horizon problem, it doesn't matter when the problem starts, you should arrive at the same optimal solution. But for some reason, uh, people exhibit, so humans exhibit time inconsistent policies, okay? Uh, so even if, you, even if you applied the optimal trajectory so far, optimal action so far, uh, you might want to completely change your optimal course of action in the future. Let me give you another example. Suppose I brought a bag of cookies here, okay, and all of you are hungry, I'm sure, because you're all grad students or undergrads. Uh, so I bought a bag of cookies, and all of you thought, look, if I have the cookie, I need to go do exercise tomorrow morning to burn out that 100 calories or whatever, 200 calories. And so you have the cookie, with the strong determination that tomorrow morning, the first thing you are going to do is hit the gym. And then tomorrow morning happens, you feel sleepy or whatever, and then you don't go to the gym or you skip the gym. How many of, this, how many of you have had this experience before? Okay, almost everyone. <laughs> this is another behavior, time inconsistent behavior. Okay, so what was the optimal policy? So gamma one star was to eat the cookie and gamma two star was to go to the gym. And you, you, you applied gamma one star, you had the cookie, okay? That was the, maxim, the, the, cost maxim, the cost minimizing action. But as soon as the time arrived, future arrived, you didn't do the optimal course of action you had set for yourself. So that's another time inconsistent policy. So while we talk about dynamic programming and optimization and optimal control and all that stuff, everything breaks down if you have a human in the system, okay? Because humans exhibit time inconsistency, what they had originally planned to do in the future, they, will not, they may not do, no matter whether they pick some other policy or they pick the optimal trajectory they have thought for themselves. Okay, so that's another time inconsistent uh, policy. Um, so in the assignment six, which I'm going to upload soon, I will uh, give you a problem Based on this idea, I'll give you another problem where I'll ask you to derive the optimal set of strategies using dynamic programming and then show time inconsistency in the decision making. So typically that happens if you use uh, what is known as hyperbolic discounting. So hyperbolic discounting works as follows. Oh, I don't have time. 
uh, very quickly, at every time t, you want to minimize g of t plus alpha summation of g of s, s equals to t plus 1 to capital T. So what you do is, and your alpha is some, uh, some parameter less than 1, so at every point of time t, you want to minimize the current cost, plus you want to discount the future cost that you are going to incur. Okay? And so every time you change this, you apply your strategy according to this fashion, then you will keep changing your strategy at every point of time because of the hyperbolic discounting term. So with this, uh, we'll talk about, the, I mean, so this, is, this forms the basis of what we are going to do next, which is talk about discounted dynamic programming in the next class. Thank you.